family emergency uh, here last night, so he's not going to continue with us tomorrow. So if you have a question, we want to approach him. We could approach him uh, during lunch. Uh, he will be leaving uh, us at 3.30. Uh, 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 Social creatures like human beings, they have a moral sense. So the primatologist 
Francis Hall has argued, I think quite persuasively, that for social creatures, including human beings, cooperative behaviors, and in some sense moral behaviors, are not kind of a veneer over our true self or selves, but in fact our instinctive mode of being. So the only way you can be a social creature is to understand what the other creatures around you want to be. I want you to do. So think about how we punish the worst of the worst in society in this behavior. First person in jail. What do you do to punish a prisoner in jail? You put him in isolation. Right? That's very psychologically stressful and physiologically stressful. Human beings do not like to be isolated. So if that's the sense that we're connecting to other people, then this uh, mechanism of emotional contagion, I'll call it empathy, may in fact be a mechanism through which we are navigating and adapting to the social environment that we find ourselves in. And I've read a couple of books there that, that uh, generate the same kind of support from the evolutionary perspective. Uh, a nice book by Ridley, uh, Schirmer's book, and uh, that part also. So that I thought just about, about this too. Uh, Francis C. C. Edgeworth wrote a wonderful book in 1881 called Mathematical Psychics. An essay on the application of mathematics to the moral sciences. Of course, I love this book. This is perfect for me. Uh, in a footnote, he actually kind of the, the following model, uh, which has been developed and stolen and uh, uncited by many, many others. Uh, but basically, the model says the benefits that I get, I'm person one, are uh, I can utilize my own benefits and from the benefits that someone else gets. And there's this parameter alpha that determines the degree to which I care about someone else's benefits. Uh, this alpha, alpha parameter, is word called effective sympathy. So it's kind of how much I'm connecting to this other person, or how much I care about him or her. So um, that's really interesting to me. So now we actually have a nice formal model that will tell us um, under what circumstances I might want to care about the you know, answers or someone else's outcome. What's the difficulty with this model? Uh, the difficulty is that we have to have some some tap in it. I will just we'll just throw it out there. Here it is. Um, it, it may or may not work. So um, what I think gives us some leverage on understanding these issues is if I can manipulate the alpha. I can come in and say well, I can do this thing, and all of a sudden I make alpha high or make alpha. Yeah, I can do that, but I can get a sense of the situations in which alpha is high or low, and which I would expect to see um, more for social behaviors, more other regarding behaviors, and newer self behaviors. Okay, so what I will focus on in this talk is uh, three experiments from my lab that have done just that, that have sought to manipulate alpha. In particular, I want to focus on uh, one moral behavior, which is generosity. And so I want to look at uh, a zero-sum strategic setting in which if I get more, you get less. Okay, very, very simple. I'll just try to have some detail. Um, all these papers are published or should be published. I'm not going to go into the details of every paper. What I want to do is to be assessed how we run these experiments in any way. So that's where I'm going. So how do we do this? How do we grab onto alpha? How do we find out? Uh, how much thing is how to change it. Okay, I'll introduce you to my friend Thomas. So Thomas is a name I coined for the human uh, oxytocin mediated attachment system. So this is a brain circuit that is potentiated by a molecule of oxytocin uh, that we discovered a number of years ago facilitates trust between strangers, trust in a you know, tangible, viable way to tell you about. And um, I think this is the basis for empathy. Uh, I think this is the basis for generosity, as I'll try to show you today. So I want to try to grab onto this brain system and then push on it and see what happens. Okay, so that's where I'm going with this. I'm going to save you the, the neuroanatomy lesson on how to work. You can see that in the short. Okay. So the, the sort of key, one of the key molecules in here is molecule called oxytocin. Uh, this is an ancient molecule in the brain. It's uh, unique to mammals, although it has history in uh, fish and lizards as precursor molecules. Uh, we have nine amino acids, 
it's found primarily in evolutionary old areas of the brain. So it's just been in the mammal and lineage for quite a long time. Uh, it's classically associated with uh, reproductive behaviors, uh, sexual activity, childbirth, breastfeeding. And in some mammals, the 3% of mammals that are socially monogamous, oxytocin facilitates uh, pair bonding. Uh, that is, you have uh, males and females who uh, cohabitate to care, pick their offsprings, pick their offspring. Uh, in all mammals, it facilitates maternal care for offspring. Uh, in monogamous mammals, maternal care as well. And in these monogamous mammals, it looks like it also facilitates what we might call cooperative behaviors among conspecifics. Right, so I have a group of group loading animals, uh, say in a burrow, and we have males that will uh, jointly engage in some kind of task. Uh, so our idea back in 2011 was that maybe the same molecule, which is in fact found in humans, might facilitate cognitive behaviors in human beings. So I'm going to review that research for you briefly. But the big claim from this lecture is that uh, oxytocin is in fact a physiologic signature for empathy. So I see if I can in the next half an hour, convince you of that. Maybe 20 minutes, we'll see how schedule. But I can convince you that oxytocin really is this uh, measure of, of empathy. If it is, then I can push on this, change my outcome, and see a result of change in behavior. So I'm going to set the bar fairly high on these uh, experiments I'm going to show you. In particular, I'm going to remove the normal cues that we have for appropriate social behaviors. I'm not going to allow experimental subjects to interact face to face. Because then I face the problem that you know about when you use college students for experiments. They're called the cube value girl problem. So the person across me is a cube value girl, and you get totally differently of course. And it's, you know, some guy you don't know. Uh, okay, so I would remove that. I remove the, the effect of smiles, of eye contact. Um, because the feedback we're getting constantly that tells us about what our behaviors are appropriate and acceptable. I'm doing that because I want to control all those other factors. So to some extent, I, to some extent, I want to take a very personal act and depersonalize it. So we're going to have uh, subjects interact by computer. They'll interact using money. And they'll do that in a uh, well-defined sense. Uh, there will be no deception in these experiments. We'll give them lots of information uh, about how what they do affects how much money they can make, how much money someone else can make. Uh, but we remove the impacts of our reputation. Uh, we remove this uh, uh, kind of showing off uh, for the other sex. So we're going to do this so that we have a very clear kind of result. And we're also doing this in a one shot setting. So I can build a reputation for being a cooperator. Uh, it's either me or you, more or less. Okay. Uh, that's not my computer's checking it out here. Okay. Right. Um, I can't use my computer apparently. So, uh, the backpack of these studies is uh, work that we published in 2004, 2005 um, using a uh, task called the Trust Game that Kevin McCabe invented in the back, um, in which uh, if you uh, transfer money to another stranger in the lab, a computer, that money will triple, and the other person can either keep the money or send it back to you. And uh, what we showed is that uh, if you are in receipt of this, uh, this money, someone takes money out of their pocket, sends it to you, they do that because the pie will grow. Uh, they say to you, look, I trust you, I'm going to give you full this money, but I'm doing that because I hope that you get it, you quote get it, and you'll say, oh yeah, this experiment is about to make this pie grow. I'll send it to you, and you're supposed to ship some back to me, although you're under no obligation to do so. So what we show is that the more money you receive as a player two in this game, the more your levels of oxytocin go up, and in turn, the more you receive the game. Okay, so we seem to have this mechanism in our heads that suggests and motivates us to reciprocate, even though we don't really have to. This is a blind setting. You get paid in private notes and know what you made. I take out a little slip to a uh, Bible administrator, cashier, patient, you just know what's going on. Uh, so why would you do that? Uh, so it looks like, again, we have this ancient uh, hormone that seems to be doing it. Now, what's the problem with the study? Well, maybe we're sloppy scientists, maybe we just mismeasured it. Turned oxytocin is very hard to measure, has a very short half life, it degrades very rapidly. So we have very tight handling protocols. And having said that, 
So we, we uh, have to make both decisions. We randomize with the personal art person too. So psychologists call this perspective thinking. We're really forcing it to get a person perspective because you might be the other person. Makes you think about this very clearly. Okay, so generous offers are those that are above the minimum acceptance threshold, and we're going to listen to your own minimum acceptance threshold. But we're also looking at this experiment or this task at punishment, so we can look at uh, the minimum level as your offer. So what's the level in which you decide to punish the other person? At a cost to yourself, by the way. This is not their serious this punishment. This is punishing the other person because they're being stingy. Okay, so if that threshold was high, then there's, there's a sense of entitlement, there's a sense of, I want to punish this person uh, because they're not being nice, they're not following the social norm. All right, so I want to run three experiments with like, three different manipulations. The first one is to infuse oxytocin into these individuals and see if we can get push on this fiber in the brain and change generosity. Uh, the second is to infuse testosterone uh, into these people. Why testosterone? Because it inhibits the binding oxytocin. So essentially it works as an oxytocin antagonist. And the third is to make exactly on the empathy issue that has a certain problem on antisystems. And that is to use an empathy manipulation, which I'll show you, and see if, if I raise your level of empathy, if that changes behavior. Okay, so what do we find? Well, let me show you the first way. Um, this is a uh, but the ABC news, just to show you how we uh, use oxytocin with the brain. Uh, so I make this up at home in my bathtub, and I put these little inhalers, and uh, we shoot them in people's brains. And how do we find how to do this? The way all brain science is done, I practice on myself and thought how I it worked. Uh, so I'm going to show you how this works. And the trick is actually to use it slowly so that it's on the throat. Okay, so uh, if you put too much of this out in people's noses and it goes on your throat, you can't get out so on that. So each spray here is 0.1 milliliters, so it's a little bit of spray. And we spray about five of these into a nostril and have a person take a very deep breath. This is uh, kind of almost from our lab, this is my professional nose model. Okay, there will be five more squirts in their nose. And so we go a total of 40 squirts over the course of uh, 30 to 60 seconds. Okay, so we found this actually uh, reduces the amount that goes down the throat and allows us to slowly diffuse uh, the mucous membranes into the brain. All right. All right, so we do that with this drum load for about an hour, so it gets into the brain, and what do we find? We find a substantial increase in generosity. We find 80% increase in generosity that is offered that exceeds the minimum acceptance threshold. Um, we did a variety of tests to make sure that this held up statistically. Um, we, indeed, we had people uh, play another game from Australia Phenomics called the Dictator Game. Uh, it's so simple as to be probably not deserving of the word game, where the, this is a task in which a game decision maker one is ten dollars, decision maker two has zero, and decision maker one is just asked to make a unilateral offer to decision maker two, person two has no say in this. So this game is hot to measure altruism. Right, so you have ten bucks, you match someone else, they have nothing, you want to send them some money. Okay, so most people send one or two dollars. So uh, the idea here is that we might have individuals who just based on their very altruistic and somehow we're picking these people up in our experiment. So um, we don't want to ask those who affects altruism. At first, that might seem surprising, but again, remember, uh, oxytocin is associated with social behaviors, with an understanding of what other people have been doing, connecting to them, uh, attaching to them. And the altruistic task is just about you. If you've got to think about someone else in the room, what do you want to do? We don't find an effect on that. But in the older end game task, we do have to think about other person. We have to think about what they're going to feel, how they're going to react. Because if you don't, you're going to lose money. I say, all these experiments I'm showing you are, are fairly unpleasant. This is two teaspoons of liquid under your nose, and you're going to sit in these hard chairs. And the rest of the experiments, I'm going to poke everyone with a needle and take blood from you as well. So, these are, these are, you know, the, the little bit of money we take them, uh, they earn, they definitely earn this money. So, to actually give up money to somebody else is actually fairly surprising. Okay, so even if I control for uh, baseline altruism and indicator game, we still have a statistically very large impact from the oxytocin manipulation. So it still explains um, high degree of generosity. Okay, so I'll give it a graph. Let's see what that looks like. All right.
Okay, so on our first dot, we seem to be making progress on this. All right, so we're now connecting oxytocin, which I think is associated with activity, but I haven't shown you that. I'll show you that in a minute. With uh, greater, gen more generous behaviors, in fact, substantially more generous behaviors, uh, when I push on this letter. Okay, so let's move to study two. Uh, this one we've used testosterone to men. We've used a gel, ender gel, just given to uh, hypogonadal men. Um, in this experiment, we uh, drew blood before and after to confirm that their testosterone levels were higher. Uh, we did this because the skin acts as a reservoir for testosterone and it uh, diffuses slowly in the bloodstream. Uh, this is a, a, a FDA approved drug, it's a published from Magnetics. So, this, uh, testosterone peaks after amber gel, the drugs called amber gel after uh, application about 18 hours later. So we instructed the men in the experiment uh, not to shower, not to exercise heavily, and when they came back from the lab, uh, we drew their blood before they did the experiment 18 hours after to make sure that was true. Okay, so uh, this guy in the picture is, is one of the few skinny guys we have in this. Uh, most of the guys actually were really big and buff. Who wants more testosterone? Hey, we'll pay you to do that. So I just show up my face. Okay. Uh, so they wrote this stuff on their shoulders and arms. Uh, they go for uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. They come back the next morning. We got their blood in the afternoon. They come back in the morning, mark the blood again. And then we have them do the same tasks. And what do we find? We find that you as a male, compared to you as yourself, this is a double blind placebo controlled crossover study. So I put David on testosterone today. He comes back in four weeks and I put him on placebo. He doesn't know what he's getting, I don't know what he's getting. So I compare David to himself. Now, what do I find? First of all, I find that we did substantially raise testosterone for every subject we experiment. So we can exclude anybody that we wash it off. And we find a 27% reduction in generosity in the ultimate game. And we also find greater punishment for others who were ungenerous towards them. So if you're a decision that you're still in the, in the uh, ultimate game, uh, you demand at a higher level before you accept the offer, you uh, compare it to yourself on placebo. You want testosterone versus yourself on placebo. So we have this nice kind of dichotomous relationship in which the alpha males are more self serving, and they would presumably give the testosterone at least logically, um, but they're also uh, much more willing to punish others who aren't playing nice. At least some people are willing to punish others who don't play nice. Okay. And nicely, both of those effects scale with the male's level of testosterone. So since we have, again, individual variations of testosterone anyway, uh, we looked at these correlations and they're all quite high. So uh, we don't just get this kind of average difference, but we get the higher tier of testosterone, uh, the more likely you are to uh, have a higher threshold threshold, and the higher testosterone, the less generous you are. Okay, this also holds when we uh, have men play the dictator game as a control. There's no effect on the dictator game testosterone and controls the order which came a lab much better than statistical test. So again, no higher patient report. So it looks like again creating out the males um, reduces the amount of generosity relative to the same Okay, so three, let's try to take on the uh, the organism. ones are the uh, yeah, placebo and the blue dots are the ones we go in. It's our hot drug and uh, the blue dots are the one on placebo. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I think on the empathy issue very directly and ask, uh, can we actually uh, see a spike oxytocin when uh, we empathically engage it? So we developed a 100 second video, which I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, we drew blood before and after, and we also had to play a $40 mini game. The previous was mini game for $10 games. Uh, this one was, was more invasive, it was more painful. Uh, and again, the, the uh, protocols now for handling uh, oxytocin blood, uh, we developed a very, very tight. They require very fast timing. Uh, those are published on both of them all, but basically, you got to capture the signal very quickly. It's a three-minute half-life of oxytocin. So 
you got to do the task, grab the blood, um, uh, keep it cold, separate it, and get it on the ice and freeze it fast. Um, uh, one of the bottles we use, but you know when you go to the doctor, you know, they always like to take your blood. Oh, my, you left on the right arm. I wonder what the bottom is called when you have a lobotomy. So we come in, take your arm, jab the needle, and we don't take one shot. We don't have time for that, we can get the signal very fast. So, we sort of warn our subjects they can drop out. You know, to be in this experiment, you know, false needles, and you don't like that. I'm not sure what. Okay, so here's a little video. Uh, let's see if I can get audio on this. Uh, you know, we can talk about this sort of stuff. Yeah. It's climbing, he's navigating everything, so he's laughing, and he's playing with his brother. You know, he and Eli haven't played with one another for six or seven months now. So, uh, what do we take from that? Uh, I think empathy is 
are moderating this self other eye, right? In, in the video at the end, uh, that eye was, was broken down completely. But I think we're always kind of moderating that. I don't sure I care about myself versus another person. And empathy is one way how we do this. And uh, this system, which we call Thomas, which is attention to eyes and substance, seems to be one mechanism of the brain in which um, this happens. And it's an interesting brain circuit because it's so evolutionarily old, evolutionarily old, it's outside of our conscious awareness. I'm not doing a calculation thinking about, uh, let's see, how much I do, it's just a sort of sense. So it's really in these uh, areas where it's associated with emotions. So the strong emotional component that suggests how we should behave. Okay, and obviously we're adaptive, we're adapting to the kind of environments that we're in. Uh, the physical environment, the social environment, our own physiological state is giving us information about how generous or ungenerous we should be. All right, I have a couple other quick uh, little pieces of evidence that uh, might make the case uh, stronger, so let me show those to you. We have been investigating uh, a variety of non-pharmacological ways to raise oxytocin. And in animals, if you stroke the belly of a rodent sufficiently, you can induce oxytocin release. So we started thinking about why we have all this touching. So since I've been here in Richmond, uh, I don't know, 16 hours, I probably shook hands with, um, I don't know, three dozen people, easy. Okay. So why do we do this? What we, what's all this touching? What about hugging and kissing and germs? Who knows what's on your hands, right? Um, so this idea of this experiment where we have people touch each other. Okay, what's the problem? So here's the first experiment we did. You come in. Introduce some subjects to each other and have them hug each other. That experiment you can't run for lots of reasons. First of all, it's just too weird. You're always going to grab with someone you've never really met before for like 15 seconds. Number two, I will definitely get sued because someone will get grabbed the wrong way or held the wrong way. Okay, so instead, we thought, well, who is able to touch you? Well, it turns out that. When we draw blood, of course, we call the ocean apartment, so you have to wear a lap coat. So if you wear a white lap coat, you can touch people a lot more than you can without a lap coat. Because there are certain people in society, certain professions, who are allowed to touch you in more intimate way. Clinicians, your hairstylists, and massage therapists. So this experiment, uh, we hired licensed professional massage therapists, spent $8,000 massage therapists, and never got touched for us. Uh, and we can't people come in, come in, you get a blood clot, you get randomized to get a 15 minute massage, or on Saturday days, you just rest the party for 15 minutes in the same room, and then you went and did this uh, trust game task. Okay, so now we have really separate out the touch requirements. So if I'm touching uh, Elias, I'm getting lots of information, physiological information, and smell information, and your body and space barrier, but here we have a massage therapist actually. So what we found, in fact, was that massage alone did not induce oxytocin release, but it seemed to prime the brain to release oxytocin. So people who were touched and then were trusted in this cash for someone's energy money uh, had much higher oxytocin release than the control rest people, and it reciprocated an enormous amount of work, 243% more. It's a huge effect. So uh, the, uh, in that graphic, the dark bars are the uh, people in the massage group, and the gray bars are the people in the rest group. So, no question about it, that they're considered at a higher rate. And now we're not receiving the hands of massage therapist, but we're receiving the hands of a stranger. Right? So, it suggests the system is very blunt. Right? This is not a fully developed system. It's just a sense of getting like, oh, wow, this life's good. Yeah, I'm going to share a lot of money. Yeah, so, um, we also have investigated the downside uh, of people who don't seem to respond to oxytocin. Uh, we're calling this oxytocin deficit disorder. Um, I published a paper on this in 2005, and um, very recently, September, or November 19, 2008, uh, a, a very pleasant guy in San Francisco named Hans Reiser, who was convicted of murder of his wife, uh, is uh, now Sam Clinton, delivered a handwritten four page appeal to the California Court of Appeals uh, requesting that his conviction be thrown out because his uh, his lawyer had oxytocin excess. Okay, so I didn't have research. So this is really, you know, worrisome. So anything you do will get picked up right away by someone who wants to use it. Okay? So we do find that about 2% of our so-called normal subjects um, do have oxytocin uh, deficit disorder. That is, they're not, uh, looks like they're not uh, have oxytocin binding through a receptor and they're kind of immune to this effects. Okay, we 
work in this now in uh, service with people with uh, social anxiety disorder. They do have very high story value on success. So 2% okay, so, um, ain't bad, you think about it. So, so most of the time, if I'm using the census I have, I'm going to look around and say, well, this person's useful. I need to go wrong. 98% of the time, people are going to be reciprocated, right? The 2% are going to be hard to spot, right? Uh, these people essentially look like sociopaths. Uh, they don't have a set of response that, that we do. Um, and yet, they learn to simulate this. Right? These are the content. These are the uh, uh, maybe politicians. I don't know. Uh, so these are people who are going to simulate these emotional responses by the All right, so what do we conclude? And this one goes right. The theory of most sentiments, I think, is pretty much on target. Um, what we don't have is why. Right? We know that this is an old, evolved system. It's a system that uses our emotions. It's uh, an evolutionary old layer to the brain, slow our conscious awareness. And this uh, larger brain circuit that taught us really connects us to other people. There's a real sense in which uh, we are part of the larger pattern of humanity. We're connected to all those around us uh, in a very real sense. And I think the larger implication is that it really makes civilization possible. Right? We don't need to have someone direct us on what we have to do all the time. I think we have, as a society, or as societies, we set boundaries. We say, well, this, this is the visual line of the type of life cycle, because sometimes our intuition, our moral intuition, is not perfectly precise. Uh, but, but we don't need a lawyer, at least in every transaction, because pretty much we know what's appropriate and what's not. As we go through the world, we're getting feedback all the time, we're tuning the system. So uh, I think this is really worth a rally cluster on this. Give a sense of what's socially appropriate and what's not, and we'll just turn around and some of things like that. Okay, I should acknowledge uh, many, many funders. Uh, this is, uh, research is very, very expensive, and uh, lots of nice people sent us uh, big students to the money so we can do this research. And I have a blog on psychology today called Moral Module. Which you can look at to see uh, based on research and uh, all the things that we can get. So, thank you very much. I'd be happy to take some questions. So uh, Alder Wissagin and his co-authors gave uh, 
IQ test to a thousand truck drivers, and then had them play a trust game. And uh, he found that the high IQ truck drivers offered much more than a trust game. Um, are there any really cognitive skills or personality traits that are associated with uh, trust and behavior in the game? It's a great question. Uh, we, when we first started doing this, we had uh, around 240 questions, a ton of psych surveys on the mood, cognitive skills, do you move your roommate stuff when they're gone? Do you lock the door? How can you call your parents when your parents are married before? She had siblings. Do you believe in God? Do you pray? Do you go to church? On and on and on, nothing matters, basically. Small effects are removed, but not much else. Um, we haven't done IQ tests, but in fact, uh, on average, people who trust other people uh, make $14 in as a decision maker one, and 17 as a decision maker two is. So they're meeting the Sunday work in actual equilibrium, which started this problem that delivery notion, at least for this game. Uh, why are they doing that? Because they have some model human nature in their heads. Right? So um, at least we're using college students, so we don't see a lot of variation in our key right thing. And we looked at nature, we looked at ethnicity, we looked at gender. Um, it really seems that this oxytocin release, which again is unconscious, you can't turn it off or turn it on, um, is, is driving the results. So it's really staying up right. Before I can trust you that you really have discovered the early man of hormone, uh, I do ask you how rigorously you really can test this, uh, this hypothesis of yours with uh, oxytocin deprivation uh, strategies, so similar to knockout now, so to speak. How far can you take that? I think pretty far. And we, we've measured in blood, we've infused it, and shown our causal relationship. Uh, so I change, physically change our social levels. We do this, we've got to use a functional MRI. Uh, so you know, there's, there's a real sense in neuroscience of the need for conversion evidence. So we continue to develop a body of evidence to suggest that oxytocin in the larger system of Thomas uh, motivates for functional behaviors. So I think the question on whether that's missing is a question you guys need to answer, and the scientific community needs to answer. Uh, but we're, we're pretty convinced that um, we're finding this. No, I know, but it's really doable, right? So if I just do do little uh, chili correlations, you know, not that much change, but I can actually manipulate this system and change behavior. So that's a causal relationship. So you mentioned before how people who are Rodents, 
peripheral and central at least coordinate. So we're assuming the same thing happens in the US. Um, in terms of the uh, oxytocin infusion getting into the brain, there are ultrasonic kinetics on uh, looking at blood, CSF, and um, uh, levels for hydrogenization of which essentially is one of the amino acid off from uh, oxytocin uh, infused into nasal. So we use, we use those from kinetics in terms of the time of the drug. So basically, rest of it is now associated with saying maybe 10% across the blood brain barrier. We also say that there are peripheral nervous system effects. There are also receptors in the veins, there in the heart. And we have evidence that, in fact, um, as I don't trust you, the reduction in heart rate, the increase in heart rate variability. So there's more parasympathetic time. Mark Brunel said he's always left the word, just ignore it. He ignored the second of the story. Is that one more? Yeah. I'd like to talk about your thoughts on heart life. So, um, Hormones vary greatly in their half life. Some on matters of hours, um, your connection to this down to fractions of the, 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 the second. So this oxytocin is a it's a short half life. It's a we might call it the pickle molecule. But what what do you think is going on there with this very really short half life? Yeah, neither was a great question. So why would we have such a short half life? Uh, I'm just saying you know, the, the, the brain is a conservative system, not all biological systems. It, it uh, reuses systems. It, it doesn't expand more energy than it needs to because the brain's very sensitive for it to run. Uh, so uh, that suggests that there's an opportunity of this half-life. Uh, so oxytocin is released in pulses, and that this short half-life, I think, has to do with, in terms of the, the reusing of the system outside of the reproductive realm, uh, for a quick on-off signal. So I think that there's a quick switch. So I see David, he's very nice, he's never heard me. I put the switch on, and that's all I need. I just down regulate the sympathetic towards the parasympathetic, and now I'm getting this, this slight change in that balance. I, I don't, once I've made that change, I don't need to continue that change. So, uh, at least in the animal stage, you don't see the sort of continuous release of lots of dust, and you see this pulse power release shut down, my receptor. Uh, so, I, I think it's this, it's just one part of the subtle uh, set of brain mechanisms that allow us to interact appropriately socially. It's just generating this speed response that some other device is kind of breaking that down. Once it's broken down, I'm already there. I think that cognitive system is probably coming to play. In fact, I can't really talk about that accident. That's a very nice segue. Uh, thank you very much.